Amen. I like that. You have your Bibles this morning. I would invite you to turn to the first chapter of First Peter. The first chapter of First Peter. Returning again to what is probably a very, or at least somewhat familiar passage of Scripture from the pen of the Apostle Peter. If I could share some thoughts with you this morning for just a little bit and give it a title, I might call it something like this, Reasonable Conduct. Say that with me, Reasonable Conduct. I've been privileged and blessed to spend some time working over in the produce department at Country Mart in Salem, watching people go by. One thing about the supermarket business, you'd better be a people person or you won't like it very much. I've noticed these people come walking by and come by and I've just wondered to myself, I've asked myself just how crazy is this world getting? When you see how people look and you see what people, or you hear what people are saying and you see how they're acting. And I just got to be honest with you, I asked myself the other day, just how weird can people appear these days and still be rational? Y'all say amen. You know exactly what I'm talking about because you've thought the same thing when you've looked around and you saw People, you wonder what's reasonable and what's not reasonable. But may I remind you that we need not be very quick to judge others and spend a little more time judging ourselves. Judge our personal conduct, if you will. Peter gives us a lesson on reasonable conduct, I believe, this morning. A call to personal preparedness. A call to personal holiness called a personal assurance. We find that, again, in this familiar passage of 1 Peter chapter number 1, beginning in verse number 13. If you will follow along, we'll read together. Wherefore, he writes, Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Thank God we are saved by grace through faith. God's grace abounds. We are eternally secure when we trust in Jesus. He is able to keep us. What Peter is saying is, when he mentions the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, he is talking about our entrance into heaven and, and the grace that will bring us there. He is talking about our face-to-face -face encounter with the Lord Jesus, if you will. God's grace is sufficient in all of our needs. He says, verse 14, As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which called you is holy, so be you holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be you holy, for I am holy. I've gotten trouble calling people ignorant before. People's gotten trouble calling me ignorant before. I'm just going to tell you. But I guess if anybody would have a right to say that we are ignorant, most certainly it would be the Apostle Peter under the direction of Holy Spirit. He says, one time we were ignorant. Now we need to act like we got some sense. Because God's revealed some things to us. Say amen. And this is what he says. <clears throat> Verse 17. If you call on the Father who without respect to persons judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Say fear. He's not talking about fear that... You're going to lose your salvation. He's not talking about fear that you ain't going to make heaven. You are going to make heaven if you make Jesus Lord of your life. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Sometimes I believe we need to further explain what's being taught so that we may know how to answer those who are teaching erroneously. There's your 75 cent for the word for the day. Amen. For as much, 
verse 18, as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by traditions from your fathers. He is talking about the old law and not only the old law, but the old traditions that the Jewish leaders were putting more stock in than the actual commandments of the Lord. Your old conversations, that which you were taught before, now being delivered from those by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ unto a living and lively hope. Amen. And so he writes on, verse 19, redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot who verily was ordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you. Repeatedly, the apostles, when they wrote, they spoke as if they were living in the last times. Well, they were. We are. Jesus is coming soon. Amen. These apostles maybe did not see, I don't believe they saw, the years of this age of grace that God has bestowed upon us, years in which the church is growing, years in which many are coming to understand who Christ was, who He is, what He done, what He is doing. As the church grows worldwide, we understand that we are a people that are blessed by the grace of God and we are a people who ought to have a certain conduct, a conduct which I believe that Peter makes very apparent and I believe when we study these words that we will indeed see uh, that there are some things that God expects from us even though the world around us uh, may not understand what God expects from them. Even the world, the world around us, people around us might not act like we expect for them to act. Amen. They may not look like we expect for them to look. They may not dress like we expect for them to dress. They may not talk like we expect for them to talk. They may not go places like we expect them to go. They may not do things that we expect that they should do if they are going to fit the mold of the Christian. I may remind you that God knows the desire and intent of everyone's heart and God knows that it's his business to judge and it's not Selah's business to judge. It's his business to to look at folks and size them up. And it's not Lonnie's job to look at folks and to size them up. And he knows that it is God's Holy Spirit who is to direct them and chasten them if they need to be chastened. And he knows that's the job of the Holy Spirit. And from time to time, that's the job of the preacher. Say amen through the authority of the Word of God. So don't take offense as to what I'm saying. But you listen because God tells us who who we are to be, what we are to be doing, and who we're supposed to look like, and who we're supposed to act like. And so this morning, Abounding Hope, I'm going to share with you what Peter shared to the early church, some thoughts that, that deal with our reasonable conduct, how we are to reason, how we are to fashion ourselves, how we are to act how we are to present ourselves in this world. And we need to realize that people are looking at us and therefore we ought to abstain from all forms of evil. Somebody say amen. Listen, if God's word says that it ain't right, you ought not do it. Say amen. If God's word says it ain't right, then you ought to abstain from that. You ought to go so far as to stop doing something if what you're doing even gives folks a chance to stumble and say if that's how a Christian lives then I'm not going to live like that. There are some things that Paul teaches us that are permissible for us in the gospel and yet they are not profitable for us because in doing those things it causes other folks to misjudge who we are and the one that we represent. Y'all say amen. 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 And so this morning, I want to share three quick thoughts with you. I believe when we look at this passage, we can see a call for personal preparedness, 
a, Paul, a call for personal holiness and a call for personal assurance. First of all, a call to personal preparedness. How many of you have ever heard the term doomsday dealers? Doomsday dealers. They want to come into your place and they want to build you an underground bomb shelter that's got its own filtration system and they want you to get enough of those uh, packaged foods to last you for six or seven years and they want you to have some fresh water and they want you to have all this and they want you to have all that. Y'all know who I'm talking about. Y'all seen those before? I knew a preacher one time, got on television. He got on this big kick. He said the end is near. And I don't know what we're going to do, but I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to order some of these dehydrated packages from my ministry, and you need to stock your cabinets, and you need to send $49.95 and get this little twirly bird thing that'll charge this radio so you can listen to the doomsday prophets. And I said, man, shut up and preach me some gospel, or I'm turning the radio off. Say amen. I mean, listen, I believe we ought to be ready. I think we ought to be prepared. Amen. Does anybody have a bomb shelter? My goodness, you got a tater cellar? Anybody got a tater cellar? Whew. We're all in trouble. All in trouble. But we need to prepare ourselves. We are to live what he is saying. We are to live every day as if this might be our last day. We need to have a personal preparedness that we are prepared to meet God should we take our last breath before six o'clock tonight. We will know that we are ready. We are prepared to stand before God and with the expectation and the hope and the desire that he will look at us and say good job well done my good and faithful servant and we ought to live our lives and take advantage of every moment that God gives us and live our lives in such a way that we are not going to be ashamed should we have to stand before God tonight and that we will know that we absolutely know that we have done our best that we have been motivated by faith and not by fear. Now listen to me. There is a certain fear with which we must live. There is a certain fear which every Christian is to have. And I dare say if you don't have this reverential fear where you respect God as being the authority of your life, then you might not be saved at all. Somebody say amen. Amen. I'm talking about this fear that causes you to tremble and worry and be filled with anxiety, wringing your hands, worried about what am I going to do tomorrow if I run out of money? What am I going to do today if the earthquakes? What am I going to do tomorrow if the floods come? What am I going to do if it dries up and I lose all my corn crop? Or some of you fellas don't want to lose your hay. It's talking about a life. I'm talking about a life that is motivated by faith and not fear but having a reverent, a reverent fear for the Lord knowing that he holds your future in his hand and live a life where you're prepared to meet God every day I believe that's what Peter was telling those to whom he wrote now, I was a boy scout y'all wouldn't know it I was a boy scout and our motto was be prepared I guess you could call that a code of conduct of sorts. Just be prepared for everything that comes your way. In reality, I believe that Peter is giving us Christian soldiers uh, what you might say a code of conduct. He is uh, giving us some marching orders, instructing us, uh, instructing us as he instructed those in, uh, of his day to guard themselves, to guard ourselves, to set up a defense against the number one enemy, which by the way is yourself. You know your greatest enemy is not the devil. The greatest enemy is yourself. So point your finger at yourself and say, I am my own worst enemy. 
Amen. I am. I messed up so much. And, and as soon as I messed up, boy, I got myself in a pickle this time. Well, I messed up now. Oh, Lord, how am I going to get in and out of this? Everybody in here has probably been at the point where you've done something and you said, oh, my, why did I do that? And what am I going to do now? We get ourselves in so much trouble and we're just not prepared. You remember Paul's instructions to Timothy? In 1 Timothy 4 and 16, Paul writes, Timothy, take heed unto thyself. You know what? Paul is telling Timothy to keep a constant watch over his own spiritual life first and foremost. Watch yourself, Timothy. Watch your conduct. You watch your level of spiritual awareness. You take care of yourself first. You look at yourself first. You be on guard for, for yourself first. And when you are guard from yourself and you guard for yourself, then you'll be able to help somebody else. Amen. Do you know why some of us never have an opportunity to help anybody else? It's because we're beat up so much all the time. We need somebody's help. It's because we put ourselves in circumstances and in situations where we get ourselves in so much trouble then we're not we're not able to help anybody else when they're in trouble say amen surely y'all know what I'm talking about maybe not these youngins that are still youngins but us old geezers like me and Karen you know we've been through a lot say amen that was just <laughs> all right move on past that I'm not an old geezer yet might look like it, but I'm not. Paul says, take heed unto thyself. And then he tells Timothy, take heed unto the doctrine which you teach. He says, keep constant watch over what you are teaching. Timothy, guard the truth. He gives him two, two objectives. And then he says, continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and those that hear thee. In doing these two things, he would avoid the apostasy that would come, the false teachings that people would fall to and would keep others from doing the same. That's what he meant when he says, save thyself. How many times am I going to take the opportunity to stand up here and tell you works ain't going to save you? Amen. And it's my job to quote scriptures like this and let you know that the Bible is not saying that your faith is saved by works, but what it is saying is you guard your conduct, you guard what you believe, you guard what you teach, and then, and then you will save yourself from the false teachings that will surely come. And may I say today, they're all around us, amen. And we bear a responsibility, spiritually speaking, not only for ourselves, but we bear a spiritual responsibility for those little ones that we hold on our lap, those little ones that are back there in children's church, uh, those that are just coming in uh, off the streets, perhaps, that don't have a church background, that don't know the things of God. We are, we are spiritually accountable to help them uh, understand truth and move them along the way as God lets us. Amen. We bear a responsibility. Personal preparedness. Peter instructs them to do three things in verse number 13. What a short introduction that was. Look, number one, he says, verse 13. Guard up your minds. He says they were to guard up their minds. The imagery is that of personal discipline and outward conduct. When you learn to discipline yourself, then your conduct will be what it should. Amen. If you don't have any personal discipline in your life, then who knows what you're liable to do. Amen. You want to know how come you get in trouble so much? It's because you don't have discipline. Say amen. Say amen. That's all right. Uh, well, I sure do like it over there at Country Mart in that produce department. Son, I've eaten so much watermelon and cantaloupe and strawberries and cherries my Lord, I even ate two turnips the other day. Raw, son, that's good. You know what I realized? I'm going to have to get some discipline or uh, later on I'm going to regret this. But listen, you got to try everything you sell a customer, right? Say amen. So I can tell you, I had some folks come up today. Old timer come up in his blue jean, his overalls, amen, had his darling wife there. And uh, he said, young man, is these peaches free stone peaches? 
And I just took my knife out and I said, now before you get hasty on making your decision, let me just cut this and you just try it for yourself. When I knew what was happening, I cut that thing and juice just run all over the place. I cut on around that thing and I said, look here, man, they may not be what you expect them to be, but they sure are good. Taste this and you try this. And you know what? Sold him. The instant that he saw that juice, the instant that he saw I was willing to crack that thing open and not hide anything from him, he was sold. Say amen. Now, there's, there is a Christian principle there. I'll let you figure out what that is, amen, because I'm going to move on. He says we need, to have, we need to gird up our minds. We need to have personal discipline, you know, kind of like a football player. Uh, and puts on his pads. He knows that he's getting ready to go out there in the trenches, and he wants to gird up himself. He wants to be ready to face whatever uh, uh, may happen. Paul uh, compared us to... Uh, uh, being a warrior, Ephesians 6, you remember? Uh, the armor of God. Uh, you know, the mind has been called the arena of action. That's where all of our activity of our mind uh, uh, motivates us. My mind sometimes is an arena of disarray, and, and yours probably is sometimes too. But he's saying we need to gird up our minds. In other words, he's giving us a lesson that we need to have our minds right. We need to keep our minds right. We need to be prepared with our minds so that when we see things, we can see them as they really are so that we'll use uh, uh, some, some spiritual insight, uh, so that we'll use some spiritual knowledge, so that we'll use some spiritual wisdom as we live this life, so we'll be prepared for every situation that comes up. And then he says, be sober. Say that with me. Be sober. Or say that with me. Be sober. In 1977, Americans consumed more than 416 gallons of whiskey annually. Be sober. Jack Daniels tells me, live freely, drink responsibly. Jack Black sold 11 million cases last year. Be sober. Be sober. I got to be honest with you. <laughs> In 1977, me and my buddies, George and Willie and Waylon and Merle, we drank our share of that 416 million gallons of whiskey. Some of you will get that after a while. I told my wife just this week, I says, it's my daddy's fault. I turned out like I did. I'll be honest with you, Ira Raymond Miller is in glory. Hallelujah. And my daddy, my daddy was a cowboy. My daddy was a drunkard cowboy, son, I'm telling you. My daddy went bar hopping and broke my mama's heart. My mama, my daddy took my mama to the dance hall every Friday and Saturday night. Drug me with them. <laughs> I really, really, I can't help, man. Y'all got to understand. Uh, every Friday and Saturday night, uh, they sent me up there by the stage, and here was these guitar players, and you know who they were singing. You know who was big back then? It was Waylon and Willie and George and Merle. And so, you know, listen. It's just how it is. But I want to tell you something. My daddy got saved. Amen. My daddy got gloriously saved. And he took the alcohol away from him. He saved me. And he took the alcohol away from me. And son, I just believe if he can save daddy and he can save me, I pray for Willie Nelson to be saved. I'm, I'm telling you right now. Honest to my soul, y'all think I'm ridiculous. I'd love to see Willie Nelson get saved. Wouldn't y'all, amen? I'm telling you. Man can sing. Be sober. Be sober. In context, it means to be alert. Spiritually speaking, be alert of spiritual dangers. You have a spiritual awareness about you. I'm telling you right now, if you run around very long with Jack Daniels, you ain't going to have no spiritual awareness. You listen to me. I'm talking to somebody. If your two best friends are Jack Daniels and George Dickel, you ain't got much spiritual awareness. You hear me. Now, I don't believe we got any drunkards in the house. But listen, somebody needs to hear this.
If you get too far in the things of the world, you're not getting too far in the things of God. Somebody say amen. If you're getting too far in the things of the world, you're not getting too far in the things of God. I believe sometimes we just need to realize that we need to be sober-minded. We need to be thinking about the things that God would have us to think about and be the kind of people that God wants us to be. And like a boxer, man, we need to keep our guard up. We need to stand against those things that would come against us. We need to stand against them temptations that would come against us and we need to stand up and we need to have some backbone about us and we need to call sin, sin and we need to separate ourselves from sin. Amen. What else does he say? Hope to the end. Without hope, we are most miserable of men. Emily Dickinson once said, hope is the thing which feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. The Blessed King James Bible uses the word hope some 130 times. The psalmist wrote, For in thee, O Lord, do I hope. The psalmist wrote, For thou art my hope, O Lord. Thou art my trust. And so Peter is warning them. He is warning us, really, about being discouraged. Don't lose hope. He says, be sober-minded, be sober-minded. Gird up your mind. Don't lose hope. Have hope. He's reminding us that the source of our hope, you read the text again, is the grace of God. The method of our hope is God revealing to us who he wants us to be. Uh, the, remain, the reminding of the object of our hope is Jesus. Listen to me, abounding hope. Hope to the end. Be sober. Gird up our minds. Keep the hope and keep the faith and we'll be prepared to meet God. Amen, preacher. Notice with me verse 14, 15, 16, and 17. We see not only a call to personal preparedness in the passage, but we see a call to personal holiness. Notice he told them to be obedient children. Obedient children. I kind of had a concept with what it meant to be an obedient child when I was younger, Vance, you never had that problem, did you? Amen. I had a problem. Cassidy had that problem. She had to be taught. Somebody say amen. Karen, Cassidy. Took me a while to understand the concept of obedience. But mama tried to raise me better. Webster says this. Obedience is compliance to a command. Obedience is a rule of duty. Obedience is a performance of what is required of us by authority who is over us. Obedient children, children of God. And Peter reminds us, I guess, of the straight gate and the narrow way that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 7 and 14. Our main business is to be holy. Our main business is to be holy. And someone, <laughs> I'm backsliding bad, Lonnie. Someone named Hank once said, if you mind your business, you won't be minding mine. You know what? We need to mind our business. We need to dot our I's and cross our T's and know the difference between our P's and our Q's. We need to get ourselves in line. We need to be holy. We need to understand what it means to obey the commands of God. We need to understand that our duty, first of all, is to manage our own hearts. Jesus said, judge not that you be not judged. And then he says, Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Our first duty is to manage our own affairs and take care of our business and take care of what we know is right and change the things that we can change and do what we're supposed to do and give an example to others of what they ought to do and then maybe they'll get a hold of Jesus and they'll see there's some examples around them some God-fearing men and women and they'll set their eyes on Jesus and they'll become more than they could ever become if they were on their own. With Jesus, all things are possible. Amen. Notice the passage at hand, verse 15 and 16. We are to be holy 
Because God is holy. And Jesus is our example. And there's a truth that presents itself in verse 17. I believe that our holiness is a condition for answered prayers. I believe sometimes I don't see my prayers answered and you don't see your prayers answered. It's because we are not living like we should live. Sometimes you're not going to see the things that you pray for manifest themselves in your life because you're not living as close as you ought to to the Lord. And if you was living a little closer to the Lord, and if he's getting your life right, and getting your mind right, and getting fo your focus right, and then you might realize what God's really going to do in your life. Amen. That's good preaching. I, I preach to myself all week. We have to understand holiness is a condition for prayers, notice verse number 17. If you call on the Father, if you call on the Father, you better remember, He knows what's going on in your life. He's judging all things. If you call on the Father, don't you think you can hide your little misbehaves from Him? If you call on the Father, and don't think that you can cover up your little inconsistencies. If you call on the Father, you better realize that you're standing before a holy and a righteous God that demands such from you, and He will have His way before you have your way. Y'all say amen. We are called to a personal holiness. The, the God we pray to is also our judge. We need to realize that. Bounding hope, let me say again, our business, first of all, is to live holy. A call to personal preparedness, a call to personal holiness, a call to personal assurance. Verse 18, 19, Verse 20, I believe Peter wants us to remember the price that was paid that we might have assurance, that we have been forgiven, that we have been redeemed, that we know, that we absolutely know that we're a part of God's family. The price was high. Notice verse 18, what does it say? Verse 18 says that we were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold. I had a cowboy looking dude come to me there the other day. I was putting up peaches. He said, I need some boxes. And I said, well, if you wait a minute, I got four right here. So then, uh, I mean, son, nice beard, whiskers, cowboy hat, vest. I know that I was in good company. Amen. Did I tell y'all my daddy was a cowboy? <laughs> I said, well, I don't know your story. Tell me your story while I'm putting these peaches up. He said, what do you mean? I said, I want to know about yourself. I said, I want to know what, what you believe in, who you trust in, what's going on in your life. So he says, I'm a country music singer. I used to be until my wife told me I only sing gospel now. I said, really? I says, will you let your wife tell you that? Why don't you just let God tell you that? And I'm just being open. I mean, look, dude wants boxes. I got boxes. I slowed down because he's going to hear the gospel before he leaves with my boxes. Say amen. amen. So I'm just telling you. It is what it is. So he said, oh, I sing. I sing about Jesus now. I said, really? And so begin to talk, begin to talk. And he's, he gave me his testimony. He'd been saved and all this. And I said, well, glory to God. And uh, he says, but I remember a day when me and Johnny Paycheck was buddies. I said, really? Honest to my soul, I'm going to get out of the pulpit. This. So I said, well, I don't know, but I heard Johnny can't keep a job. Because I heard Johnny would just tell you to take a job and shove it. And you know what he did? Take his job and shove it. And right there in front of God and me and that whole display of peaches, he sings through a verse and a chorus of take his job and shove it. I said, hey man, I feel like telling him this every now and then. <laughs> so long story short, he wasn't what he used to be. He was what he, he is what he is. And he said, he just wants to follow Jesus and sing about the glory of the Lord. He said, I used to have a great big old buckle, a belt. It was made up of silver dollars. I said, well, under my soul, silver and gold. But you, listen, I got to get back to the thing. Personal assurance 
And his name was Jimmy, by the way. Jimmy had personal assurance. Whatever your name is here tonight, today, night or day, you can have personal assurance through Jesus Christ, knowing that you have been redeemed with things that are far greater than silver and gold. You were redeemed with the precious blood of the Lamb. It was the blood. It is still the blood. And it will always be the blood. Acts chapter number 20, the Apostles Paul is speaking to the elders of the Ephesian church. And he said, take heed unto yourselves. He's talking about the same thing that Peter's talking about, a personal preparedness, a personal holiness. He says, take heed unto yourselves, conduct yourself as Christians. He says, you've been made overseers to feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. Somebody say amen. The church bought with the blood of Jesus. Your salvation came. With a great cost. Christ gives us special value to God. We are heirs and joint heirs with Christ Jesus of the glories of heaven. If you know what I'm talking about, then give God praise. Amen. The price was agreed upon ages and ages ago. Verse 20 says it was foreordained by the foundation of the world that Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, the God of eternity, the God of creation, would become the God of redemption, would become the God of salvation, would become the God that is your God and my God and our spiritual director and our spiritual depositor and our spiritual assurance. His name is Jesus. He is Lord of Lords. He is to be and he shall be king of kings for all eternity. And God's people said, amen. Be assured today that a God who saves you can keep you. He can equip you. He can supply you. He can answer your prayers. And he can bless you because you appreciate the value of personal preparedness, personal holiness, you have personal assurance. You see, in him we find our assurance as Paul preached in Acts, serving the Lord with all humility of mind. That means without arrogance, we serve the Lord. Without pride in ourselves, we serve the Lord. With tenderheartedness, we serve the Lord. With a compassionate zeal in the Lord, we serve the Lord. Paul, Paul was conscious of himself. Paul knew he had weaknesses. Paul knew he had insufficiencies. And conscious of God. God revealed those to him just like Peter. I guess the lesson Peter presents us with this morning church is we should not take our salvation or our walk with the Lord lightly. Peter's teaching us a lesson concerning our reasonable conduct, how we ought to act, how we ought to walk, how we ought to talk. Amen? How we ought to act, how we ought to walk, how we ought to talk. How the world sees us determines oftentimes how they see Jesus. Say amen right there, Gerald. How the world sees us determines oftentimes how they see Jesus. What a beautiful picture and invitation to salvation. Verse 21. The Bible says, Who by him believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. He's talking about the hope, salvation. That is through Jesus Christ and none other. Verse 23, quickly. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And we say, Amen. If you don't know Jesus, if Jesus ain't Lord of your life, yes, Jesus can be your Savior. 
without being Lord of your life. Yes, Jesus can be your Savior. All those who confess their sins, call upon the name of Jesus, stress their belief, their faith, and their hope in the gospel, they shall be saved. But until you yield yourself willingly and wholly to God's will, until you do that, you're not allowing Jesus to be Lord of your life. Let Him be your ruler. He is your King. Show Him your love. Show Him your faithfulness. Give Him glory by living for Him. Show Him your confidence in Him by living like you got confidence in Him. Amen? Be sober. Gird up your minds. The list goes on and on and on. If you want assurance in God, then you make Jesus Lord of your life every day, yielding yourself to the will of God and making Jesus Lord. And you'll find that assurance. Amen? Amen. If you're here this morning and you've never confessed Jesus as Savior, then you've never made Him Lord. Amen. When you confess Him as your Savior and He becomes your Lord, and He becomes your Master, then you see Him for the King He is, the King of all glory for all eternity. And He will keep nothing from you to help you live this life of reasonable conduct that's pleasing unto Him. And all God's people said, Amen.